Hello, EnviroTime team members. Uh, my name is Dr. Colin Bramer. I am with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and today we are going to be talking about uh, aquatic invertebrates, uh, specifically insects, that live in the water. We're going to be discussing where you find them, the habitats that they live in, and some key characters on how you identify them, the ones that you should focus on um, that will help you e most easily identify them and separate them from one another. Okay, so first, let us look at the um, environments that they live in. Okay, so the aquatic habitats that you most um, commonly find uh, insects and other invertebrates, uh, the lentic habitats, known as still water, so ponds and lakes. You'll find them in flowing water, and that's probably the best place to sample for them if you're actually doing any kind of water quality surveys. And those would be streams and rivers, any kind of flowing water. And both have the, a benthic area. And so when you hear people talking about a substrate or the benthos, or the benthic community, they're actually just talking about the bottom of a pond or a stream. So let's first look at the lentic environments. And looking at a pond, you'll find that it has two major divisions or subdivisions. The first being the, the littoral or littoral zone. That is actually the area of highest productivity um, where you find the plants. Obviously, it gets more sunlight, which further provides more food and more habitat for these aquatic invertebrates. And the second section is the limnetic zone. It's more the open water where you find the fish. And on that benthos of the deeper waters, you may find clams and snails and crayfish, things like that. So the lodic environments, uh, the streams and rivers, has three primary areas where you're going to find uh, invertebrates. The first being the pools, which are deeper areas. The flow of the water is a little bit slower, uh, and that's where mainly you find fish, uh, and some invertebrates will settle out. The second area being the cut banks, where it, the stream actually cuts into the uh, shoulder of the, the stream bank, and it actually creates a nice habitat uh, for them to feed on and hide out in. And the third, and the best area to actually sample for insects, and really the only effective area to sample for insects, would be the riffle zones, where the stream is bubbling over rocks. Uh, it's usually shallower. It looks like it's running faster, but it's actually running the same rate as the rest of the stream. And there's greater oxygenation there, and because of all the cobble and habitat there, it provides greater hiding areas and surface area for food to grow for a lot of these aquatic invertebrates. So when you're standing in a stream and you're sampling, you're standing in that riffle zone and looking out, you'll notice that almost all streams will have a repeating or an alternating riffle, pool, riffle continuation throughout. Uh, and this is common. This basically just has the, um, the siltation will settle out in the pools first. And it's just where streams will alternate and then they may meander. Uh, and create pools in different riffle areas. But that riffle area is the best area to get the uh, aquatics themselves. So when you sample these insects, what you really need to do is identify them correctly. And the best way to do that is by looking at their basic bow plan or their body plan. So in an insect, it has three major body divisions. The first being the head, which is at the front end. The second is the thorax. It's basically the locomotor region where they can move around, where they have legs and wings if they're an adult, and the abdomen, which is the digestive and reproductive area. So the thorax is further subdivided into a pro, a meso, and a metathorax. And when we talk about uh, the hemimetabolous or incomplete life cycle insects, the meso and metathorax are where you're going to find those wing pads. Now the other two things to look for on the aquatic invertebrates are the antennae, which come off the head, those are the sensory organs, and then cerci, which look like antennae sticking out the rear end, but they are only tactile. And the cerci are most important for identifying two of the major groups that you do need to look at. So the first group that we are going to uh, examine are within the hemimetabolous insects. As I said before, hemimetabolous just means incomplete life cycle. It means they go through the egg, the nymph or naiad and adult stages. Uh, they do have wing pads visible on those meso and metathoraces. And they generally crawl onto a stream bank on stones or twigs or anything sticking out of the stream to emerge what sometimes is called a hatch 
uh, in a mass emergence. Now, the only thing that, that, the only organisms that are different on this are species of mayflies which will float to the surface and do a mass hatch and they actually emerge on the top of the water or the water surface. So the first group we're going to be looking at are those ephemeroptera, the mayflies. Uh, the nymphs have a general mayfly look. They just look like mayflies. Most of the time people will say, oh, look at the back end, look for three tails. Now, this is okay, but some mayflies only have two tails, which will make you confuse them with another group. So you always want to confirm by using a second character, namely the gills that are on the sides of the abdomen. All mayflies will have plate-like gills on the side of the abdomen. No other group that you need to look at has these gills, okay? These are very, very sensitive to organic or inorganic pollution, and so they are placed in group one. In other words, the most sensitive to any kind of pollutants. Now, mayflies are also interesting because they are an ancient lineage and they have a very unique lifestyle. The first time they hatch or molt into a winged form, they are not true adults. They are known as what is a, a sub-imago, which is, means sub-adult. Their wings are cloudy, they do not have reproductive organs, um, and they generally stay near a stream bank until they molt once again, which is unusual for, uh, for winged insects or the winged form, uh, and they will actually molt into an adult where they can reproduce, their wings have clarified. Their wings are always held in uh, a sail-like fashion. So just like a sailboat, they hold their wings directly over the back and it literally looks triangular like a sail. Now, mayflies, the order name is ephemeroptera. It means for a day. They literally only live for a day or two and so they do not have any mouth parts as adults. They don't need to feed, they live for a day, that's all they, they need to do. They have enough energy to survive for that day. The second group we're going to be looking at are the stoneflies, or the plecoptera. Now the nymphs of stoneflies, to me, always look more like little cockroaches that lived in the water. As you can see there, they do have the wing pads developing, uh, as those are the external wing buds. They do have two tails, and on the underside, what you want to confirm is that they have gills on their thorax. So remember, mayflies may have, may have two tails, but they will have gills on the abdomen, whereas stoneflies will always have gills on the underside of the thorax. Once again, it's a group that is very sensitive to any kind of pollution, and so they are also placed in group one. Now, when we look at adult stoneflies, the plecoptera literally means braided wing. When you look at their wings, they have a lot of venation. They look very similar to the larva. They, the only difference really that you can tell is that they do have wings, and they hold their wings flat over their abdomen. So once again, looks much, much like a cockroach, uh, but are not related whatsoever. Well, the next group we're going to be looking at are probably the most recognizable. Those are the odonata, the damselflies and dragonflies. The way to differentiate a damselfly from a dragonfly is that damselflies, which you see on your left, are usually narrower, but they always have three fan-like or plate-like gills on the end of their abdomen whereas dragonflies do not have any sort of gills and they actually, they actually pump water in and out of their, their rear end or their anus and that's how they breathe, which is kind of a, a strange way to survive in the water. So these, they are moderately tolerant to pollution so they're placed in group two, which means they are better able to survive in ponds and lakes where there's less oxygenation than in the riffle zone of a stream. When we look at adults, want, or excuse me, the uh, second character to confirm uh, dragonflies and damselflies, if you're not sure, even looking on the back end of a dragonfly, what you want to look for is the underside of their head. They have what's known as a prehensile labium, and that labium, literally, the lower lip, can reach out and grab onto prey. And as you see in the second picture, fully extended, they can reach quite a ways. They are sit and wait predators. They will actually hide out in some kind of reeds or something, or even bury themselves in the mud. They'll reach out and grab anything that swims by. And so when you see that elbowed long thing sticking out underneath a larva or a nymph, that confirms that it is a, a damselfly or dragonfly. When we look at the adults, once again, the most recognizable, they have huge eyes, they're visual predators. Um, they are very fierce, even with the damselfly on the left there. Looks very frail, hence the name damselfly. But they are, they eat tons of other insects or other invertebrates that fly around. They catch them on the wing, in other words, as they're flying. Damselflies hold their wings 
straight over their backs or straight over their abdomens, but unlike the mayflies, they don't hold them up like a sail. Dragonflies, however, hold them straight out on the sides of their body. So you can always tell they're generally a little bit more rust that, robust than the, uh, the drag damselflies also. Okay, so that ends with the uh, hemimetabolous insects. So the next group are the holometabolous insects. These are probably the most successful group of insects uh, all over the world, including the terrestrial versions, which you don't have to worry about. Holometabolous insects just means complete metamorphosis or complete development. They go through the egg, larva, the pupal stage is that critical thing, just like butterflies and moths, which are holometabolous. They will actually need to transform the larvae, break all their cells down, reform that pupa as the adult. So they actually grow their wings in that pupal stage, so you will never see any kind of wing pads on the larvae of holometabolous insects. Now these actually, since they do pupate, they usually pupate on that substrate or they might crawl into, the, into a nice moist oxygenated stream bank to pupate. Uh, very rarely do they crawl onto a stream bank before they hatch out of that final stage because they're already in this pupil. They're usually encased in some kind of a pupil case. So the first group that we're going to be looking at for those holometabolous insects are the, the caddisflies. Now there are three separate caddisfly larvae that you should recognize uh, and they each look a little bit different and they obviously have different habitats. The, all caddisflies will have two prolegs on the end of their abdomen. Each of those prolegs has a single claw on the end. Right? That's very important. The retreat-making caddisflies also have tufted or furry looking gills just on the underside of their abdomen. And the reason they're called retreat makers, as you can see on the picture on the right, they literally build a little lean-to in the substrate of the stream and spin a web or a net across it which goes into the flow of the stream. That net actually catches any kind of detritus or algae or anything that's flowing in the stream and they pluck that out and that's what they feast on. Now once again, these are very sensitive to pollution so they are placed in group one. The second of the caddisfly larvae that you need to know are the case builders. As with all caddisflies, they have the two prolegs, each proleg with a single claw. The case builders, however, just like their name indicates, they actually build a retreat or a case which they carry with them at all times. And this serves two purposes. Number one, it serves protection. So as they're crawling around, it'll protect them from being attacked by anything, but they can also tuck their heads and their legs in there to protect. But it also serves as their essentially cocoon. When they're ready to pupate, they will basically sew themselves or seal themselves in that, that case that they've built attach themselves to the substrate of the stream and pupate in there. Once again, gives them extra protection. These are, once again, because they're Trichoptera, sensitive to pollution, so they are placed in group one, the most sensitive of the uh, organisms. So the last group are the free-living caddisflies. These really don't have gills that you can notice. They obviously don't build a retreat or any kind of a case because they are free-living. In other words, they just wander around and they predate on other invertebrates. But Always look at the back end, look for those prolegs, they will have a single claw. And once again, they are in group one because they are the most sensitive, because they are caddisflies or the trichoptera. Now when we look at adult caddisflies, they look very similar to butterflies and moths, and most people do mistake them for butterflies and moths, and uh, rightly so because they are closely related, they are the cousins to butterflies and moths. Now trichoptera means hairy winged. So that when you look under a microscope, their wings are actually covered with very, very small, fine hairs. They hold their wings like a tent over their abdomen or A-frame-like, and they always have very, very long antennae. So it should be very easy to recognize the adults of the trichoptera.